Hello, welcome to Science Shambles. Uh, today we have someone who's written both beautiful novels about uh, our understanding of uh, of the sky and the stars within it, and uh, and also non-fiction books as well. And we may well also talk about his book about witchcraft as well, which I knew nothing about whatsoever. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited. But first of all, I want to briefly mention King Crimson, because you are Stuart Clark. I, I see you on, on social media very often there you are there with the guitars with other people you are not in any way caught up in cosmology or astronomy you are caught up in in a web created by uh robert fripp or others um i'm interested do you feel that within the kind of of the landscape created by some of the work of prog and i think of those incredible album covers as well of imagining other planets do you feel that your your kind of you know your your hobby interest there is a connection between that and your uh, you know what you actively do as well? Yeah, I think I think there is. I mean, it was quite uh, it was quite hidden to me. I think for a long time, but recently or more recently, I've come to realise that the whole sort of prog rock um, ideals of big ambitious musical compositions that can still have you know core of, of truth and emotion and feeling in them uh, and just letting the imagination go um, you know yeah I think there's, there's that's pretty much cosmology in a nutshell isn't it the uh, and astronomy just these huge universe that's around us and with this tiny kernel in it and there's something absolutely um awesome about just giving yourself over to it well i have to say when i i, I was lucky enough to see a warm-up gig by uh, king crimson about three or four years ago at the aylesbury waterside theater and they definitely deal with relativity because i have never when i looked at my watch at the interval i had no sense whatsoever that an hour and 45 minutes had passed you know for the four songs they played or however many it was it was an incredible uh, of, of the the movement of time and the change in the movement of time absolutely i saw steve wilson play at um the the, the hammersmith apollo um one or two years ago now uh, and the same thing happened it was just it was just one of those transcendent moments where he played the whole of uh, one of his albums from you know beginning to end and it, it i don't know it seemed like it was over in in five minutes but at the at the time it felt as if time didn't exist it was it was truly transcendent See this now transcendent moments. This interests me a great deal. I was um, talking with someone the the difference between it was actually Brian Eno. We were talking about art and science, and I wondered from his point of view the different the reaction that we have to say seeing the Apollo eight image of Earthrise, and the reaction that we have to seeing uh, a, a painting of something perhaps imagined. And he felt a, a difference, a, quite a, 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 a... Whereas I sometimes wonder about the difference between an emotion that I might feel, because I, I feel it's very similar, and I wonder how you feel about sometimes these great astronomical images we see. It is a reaction like seeing something which is, you know, a, a moment in art which moves me. Yes, I think that's something that I feel as well, because we can all be uh, moved by a piece of art, um, just purely emotionally, and just feel it. Um, and the same way we can when we see you know, an, an extraordinary image, like you say, so the Apollo 8 image of the, of the whole Earth, of the Earth rise from the moon. And I think what deepens that feeling and this is the feeling that i, I sort of believe is it, it, it gets called awe this is that we then can have some as on top of all that emotional sort of reaction to it we can also have an intellectual one for example when we see the earth rise picture from the moon you know we can we can just feel aesthetically that that is a truly beautiful thing and then it hits us intellectually that there are people out by the moon in a spacecraft that's been created by all these other people. No one person can do that. That's the that's a group of humans working 
together. Um, and so you get this sort of hit as well from it. And I th that's, a, that's where the true power comes from. And so in the, um, in, in the, in the book, in the sort of the last chapter of the book, I called it the true enchantment. Um, because we're not just looking at the night sky and you know, populating it with gods and spirits and strange forces to have that kind of mystical wonder and awe. Um, we're actually realizing that these things are aesthetically beautiful. The, the universe, the night sky, planets, nature, it's all aesthetically beautiful in the same way that you know, a human being can create art. And yet we can also understand it at an intellectual level. And the two together, I think. Um, are, are the powerful sort of define have as living thinking conscious beings why do you think in, in in the book you talk about that point where the sky for some seems to lose it, it, its wonder you talk about that idea of disenchantment and and i think that is something that seems to be a, a a problem sometimes within science itself the the fear that if you make something enchanting you have somehow removed it from being a material answer to oh no no no, no we've, we've got the equations and in your spare time you can be enchanted i'm talking to lucy green the solar scientist and she said you know the first time that she looked through a solar telescope and was able to see that solar activity which is of course you know unavailable to the naked eye or through a normal telescope um definitely don't do it if you listen really if just you know it's dangerous business now um but she was tremendously excited and she had a you know she had a visceral reaction to seeing what was going on within the sun for the first time with her eyes and um she was kind of told to hey calm down you know and and then she said that she was she was some sometimes considered by people the word she used with, to be ditzy because of her excitement about me to be i think that is a problem and do you, do you feel that's something that, that science has been dealing with or, or are we only just starting to deal with it? I think that was a problem, yes. I think, um, uh, I think we're getting better at dealing with that. So I, I understand Lucy's point of view um, completely actually because um there were times in the you know in the past when i was in academia and doing my degrees um where the, the the idea of outreach and just talking about the excitement of all of this um you know to the to, to the public is kind of looked down on and that no 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 you have to be cold you have to be detached you have to be objective you know, and, and you can be that when you're doing your maths or taking your measurement because you're doing a job at that point um, and, and the, 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 you, know, you have to do the best job that you can to, to, to get those measurements in those fleeting moments and all the rest of it. But at the same time, um, no one can deny that it's you know, the night sky, the astronomical objects, I mean, they're just so beautiful to look at. And the serenity that one feels, um, you know, when they're under a dark night sky, I think is is unparalleled. And there, as Lucy, um, you know, experienced, there's moments of true excitement, you know, and, and I think now we're getting better at realising that. And just being comfortable as scientists with that. Uh, it reminds me of a philosopher, called, a 20th century philosopher called Helen Arndt. And she thought that uh, in 1957, when Sputnik 1 was launched, the first artificial satellite, that she realized that humans never to be followed. And she she's published a plea headlong doing this could we stop and think about what it meant to do that and why we might want to do that because she was worried that um sending humans up into space you know actually touching the night sky for the first time being able to look down on the earth in its entirety she worried that this would that give us the sort of ultimate 
Archimedean viewpoint on our planet. So a point of view removed from the system that we're studying, the kind of view she felt that scientists craved so that they could be completely cold and detached about the whole thing. And she worried that sending humans into space would actually sort of rob us in some way or diminish our humanity and our empathy for Earth and the people on it. And in one of the sort of delicious ironies of history, the complete reverse happened. The most important things that came out of the early space flight, and I think probably continue to come out of space flight, are the views of the Earth and our understanding of Earth as a fragile, integrated whole that we have to steward uh, and take care of. So that's another reason why I think that this disenchantment that some felt happened with the scientific revolution in the 17th century uh, and sort of making nature out to be just cold, mechanical processes, I think that's all turned around nowadays and that we can appreciate both its beauty and how it works. I think that's that's interesting talking about that space exploration idea because I talking to to uh, Kevin Fong who did a fantastic anyone listening if you've not heard the World Service series he did thirteen minutes to the moon you really should it is an incredible series about what it took to to get human beings on the moon but but talking to him he was talking about the idea of, of bandwidth of astronauts and he said you know it, it's very you know it's such a huge mission that many of them don't have that extra bandwidth which is is something which is very rare to also get indeed some of them almost the embarrassment of it becoming something which had a level of of enchantment and and someone that I've mentioned on this many times before but rusty schweikart i think from apollo 9 is someone who is lindisfarne talk which is still uh, amazes me how few people know about this it's an incredible talk by someone an apollo astronaut talking about what he feels the meaning of going into space was and I think Jim Lovell being another one who saw himself as an explorer so that's and to me that's part of the interesting which is some of the first people we sent up were in, incredibly accomplished people but the dreamscape area of it was something that with also a military mind you would be slightly wary of mm, I think it took many of them by surprise that um, they could have these feelings um, that just that, that, that just welled up in them uh, com completely taking them by surprise. So, you know, Rusty Schweikart is a really great example that you mentioned there. And he had those few moments on one of his spacewalks. And usually these things are scheduled, you know, down to the moment, really. And they're being talked through what they're doing and communicating with uh, the uh, mission control on Earth. Um, but they needed a few minutes to think about a problem. And so Rusty found himself outside the spacecraft with a couple of moments just to look and to think. And I think he said that he just suddenly, it just suddenly hit him what um, almost a responsibility he had, that he was a privileged human being to be witnessing this view that the vast majority of people were never going to see. So how could he best communicate that feeling of sort of global oneness, if you like, that feeling of, of the whole integrated world. I talk about the overview effect, um, which all astronauts, it appears, experience to greater or lesser um, degrees, that it always changes their psychological um, sort of outlook on the world and the people within it once they have seen the Earth from space. I love that story that Bill Anders, basically one of the reasons Earth Rise is because he was really disappointed by the moon. You know, they're, they're there scouting the moon and he's going, oh, God, this is really boring. And so you suddenly look out the window and you go, oh, look over there. And that's because I, I know J.G. Ballard talked about the fact that, you know, we went all the way to the moon and we found out it was boring, which I, I think kind of misses out the real point of it is that we pulled back far enough to start to get a different viewpoint you know the the, the moon is not the important part of, of of that i think the um now you talk absolutely i was just going to jump in there because i think you again you've hit the nail on the head um because it's this pulling away from earth and having this new viewpoint um and you suddenly see for the first time ever the earth as a celestial object 
So throughout human history, we've been used to looking up into the night sky and seeing the stars and then with telescopes, seeing the planets more. But you always see them uh, completely framed in a sea of darkness, which is a perspective you don't have about the Earth unless you go into space. And by the time you get to the distance of the moon, you know, you can raise your thumb and sort of blot out the entire, your entire view of your home planet. So suddenly we were seeing it as a celestial object. It was like visceral confirmation um, of what we knew intellectually, that we were just a planet like any other planet. Now you could see it. And because you could see it, you could feel the emotional weight and the impact of that and that's where i think this true enchantment starts to develop the enchantment of loving nature and also understanding it now the uh, beneath the night has as, as it, it starts at our the, i suppose that the first ways that we can have any sense of recording of, of the human relationship with the night sky and what i find fascinating is how we are able to change and develop our understanding of what those minds are. You, know, you talk about the caves of Lascaux and, and the fact that those images over the last, what's it now, 80 years, is it? It's about 80 years, isn't it, that since, since they, they were rediscovered. Our understanding of, of what we believe those people were painting has changed a great deal, hasn't it? Yes, and, uh, and of course we can't know any of this for absolute certain. Um, but it does blow my mind to think that there's that 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 one image of of the bull, the uruk, in there. You know, it's it's half the front half of the bull, and um, then it, uh, just above its shoulder is that little grouping of dots that you know, looks for all the world like the Pleiades star cluster. Uh, the Seven Sisters, the only star cluster that um, we can easily see with our naked eye. And it's right in the same position that the stars of Taurus, the constellation Taurus, are as well. And Taurus is usually depicted on star charts as just the front half of a bull, because from the original Sumerian stories of Gilgamesh, uh, the celestial bull um, was sort of sent to to challenge Gilgamesh, um, was killed, torn in half and thrown back up into the heavens. So right from these, those earliest written stories, we have this story of half a bull in the constellation of Taurus. And there on the Lascaux Caves, whatever that is, 17,000 years ago, uh, it looks as if an artist uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a human artist drew that constellation, put the the seven sisters in place above it. So when I stand outside under the night sky and I look at Taurus, I imagine a bull shape around there. I'm going through the same thought process as that human you know, seventeen thousand years ago. I mean, that's mind blowing to me and gives me a real sense of deep time and empathy you know, with, with with other human beings. How important do you think? Because again, going back to the idea that sometimes the idea that the myth is dispelled by by the the knowledge. Whereas, in fact, it seems to me that it's quite important to understand that story and keep that story, the story you just told there involving the bull, that that, apart from anything else, it also helps lodge that image in your head. It makes it does become more memorable than than the the astronomical information. It it keeps it, it keeps it alive without saying, well, obviously, a real bull was thrown up there. You know, that that part, again, that seems to be something that we're still trying to tackle, how we manage to to hold the myth but also accept that the myth is part of our imagination, which then that imagination leads to the factual knowledge of the sky. Yeah, I understand. Um, and this, you see, once again, Robin, it's the, this is the key point, um, is that we have to balance within us the, the, the love of our imagination, our creativity, our storytelling, our collective um, myths and stories that we can hold in a cultural way. And that's just a flip side of the more scientific approach to the, the universe around us and the knowledge of the stars. So the, the two I see are, are, are not 
um, that they're not enemies of one another, they're not in conflict, and that we can, all of us, hold these ideas. We can love the sweep of our imagination and the romanticism of the images and the myths that go along with this. In the same way, you know, that I can watch, um, I can watch Star Wars or Star Trek and love those stories as being set in the, the wider universe. But I can also love my understanding of astrophysics and how the stars work and how the universe is expanding and and how gravitational waves you know fluctuate across space. And I can I can love both and know where the boundary between both is as well. Having said that, whenever we make a big leap in our understanding of the universe, it always comes from the application of imagination and creativity and probably bringing in something from outside the accepted bounds of science as it is at the moment. And so creativity and imagination have huge roles to play in our sort of paradigm shifts for our scientific understanding of the universe. When you were writing this book, were there any particularly revelatory moments for you in terms of new understandings of different cultures' relationship with the sky? I mean, you know, you, you write about Stonehenge, you write about ancient Egypt, you write about, I'm probably going to mispronounce this now, but the, uh, uh, I'm going to say Gobekli Tepe, but you're going to tell me how it's actually pronounced. Uh, you know, all of these seem to have changing perspectives of what the sky was for that culture. Yes, I, th I think you're as close with Gobekli Tepe as um, as I am as well. So um, yeah, we're <laughs> we quit that one. Uh, what astounded me was um, just how practical the you know, cultural uses of the night sky were in in those times. You know, the the the, the, the more ancient civilizations, they always had really practical goals of timekeeping or navigation. And then these myths that, that that grew up around the constellations and the patterns that they saw in the sky were almost like aid memoirs. You know, exactly like you said, you know, we remember the story of the bull um, it helps us remember that grouping and I think that's what they did they used these stories both as entertainments and as ways to remember the patterns in the sky for practical purposes the biggest revelation for me however uh, was the one that we've alluded to and talked a little bit about which is this concept of disenchantment at the scientific revolution so you know, I've been a scientist, you know, all, all my life. That's where my natural inclination has always been. And so to start reading um, sociologists talking about um, how that was a difficult moment for people, that once you start to say, actually, everything, all the stories that you think you know about the wider universe, why the night sky is up there, how what happens up there mirrors what's going on down here, you know, all of that and the astrology that goes with that, that's all nonsense. None of that is true. Instead, what we can tell you is true is what we can measure with our telescopes, calculate with our mathematics, and most of that is beyond the understanding of the ordinary person. So I now understand just what a fracture that was, that you, 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 you take away the understanding of the, the wider universe and put it into this sort of um, elite um, the natural philosophers and the scientists. And, and now I think um, that is fine. The balance is finally being redressed again, starting in the 19th century, maybe a little bit earlier, with the science popularizers and the people that tried to take this knowledge and democratize it and find ways to talk to everybody about how amazing this deeper level of knowledge is. And so, you know, you and I discussing this today, this is sort of one prime example of again, the true enchantment, 
the fact that scientists and researchers can look for this knowledge in sometimes in very arcane ways and with really complex mathematical analysis and then they can come to their conclusions uh, and then people like you and I can talk about them and disseminate it and just just see what we feel about it and how it makes us feel. So that ch it did change my perspective hugely on where science fits in to the broad sweep of human culture and knowledge. Do you think that also there's a, I mean, in terms of what we did in the 60s and 70s, there was that whole spate of books, the, the Von Daniken books, the uh, Serious Mystery by Robert Temple. Um, there are those who would say this was a very uh, colonial take on uh, ancient civilizations, that they could not not have had the wherewithal I'm just just before i started talking to you uh talking uh with rebecca ragsykes about neanderthal we're beginning to understand about their capabilities of imagination do you feel that the levels of understanding we're getting now um do help dispel those ideas that you know oh that you know oh Oh, there must have been some kind of alien into i mean obviously i, I i'm presuming built the pyramids but that's very presumptuous of me um but also in terms of we're increasingly learning that human ingenuity is not something that came around you know when when newton got his prism out absolutely so yeah for the record um yeah i don't think it was aliens that built the pyramids um yeah, it, 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 if, if, if aliens had come to Earth in bright, shiny metal starships with faster than light drives, you know, what, what are they doing mucking around with stones in deserts and triangles and things? Um, but yes, you're right. The human imagination is, is definitely something I think that you know spans um, much, much longer than than perhaps we we, we originally thought, and. The 60s and the 70s, the sort of the, the new age type movements and the books that you sort of say about von Daniken and, and these kinds of ideas, the ancient astronaut ideas and things like that. They're fascinating because they're a reaction to the um, increasingly technological world that, that we live in. It's a way of trying to re-enchant again the night sky and the wider universe with things that are beyond our understanding and, 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 and new myths, if you like. Almost, I mean, the, the aliens that, that von Daniken talks about and things like that, they're, they're, they're like the, the ancient gods. Um, that we talked about. They're, they're sort of the same thing, just given a slightly modern coat of paint. And I think the reason we don't have that around so much in the mainstream now is because of people like Richard Dawkins, people like Carl Sagan, because the great scientists who also have great ways of explaining and great ways of engaging people. And they sort of set bar, if you like, the standard for how we should communicate our science um, so that everyone can take part in the conversation, how we can truly democratize this um, subject and the way we gather knowledge in this way. And why it's fascinating, why it's important, why it's just mind blowing that, you know, we can do this collectively as people. Well, this is, uh, I mean, the book is, it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful book and it, it includes uh, amongst the astronomers and uh, amongst the different ideas of, I mean, you also have Madame Blavatsky's in there and Walt Whitman is in there. And I wanted to uh, quickly, just before we run out of time, move into the occult as well, because I've just been uh, reading a new biography of Itel Calhoun, who is the the, uh, um, the the surrealist painter and, and occultist amongst other things. You wrote a book about witchcraft, is that which I've not read yet. Um I didn't actually. Oh man, I'm so annoyed because I someone I said I've got Stuart Clark on, and someone said I love his astronomy, and I also recently bought his book about witchcraft. So it's another Stuart Clark. It's another Stuart Clark. I that know. is such a relief because it's about sixty quid, and I I nearly bought it yesterday, and then I thought just hold off uh, yeah. before yeah. and double check it is. Uh, I'm very just because I, I felt having I thought. 
could have done witchcraft because there is, you know, again, that bit where we look at our under how we fill in the gaps of knowledge sometimes with the mysterious. Could Absolutely. you write a book about witchcraft? I mean, do you ever do you ever feel yourself you'd like to write? Um, I mean, because this book straddles, you know, so many different cultural ideas. Uh, are there any, any points where you think or you feel that area is pretty much full? Well, I now feel that at least I understand where it's coming from. Those, and the sort of occult thinking. And one of an, another one of my revelations in, in writing this book was realizing that the Russian space program and modern astrology uh, came from the same motivating principle. They just have one difference in their assumption about the universe. And the one assumption is that the, the, the rocketeers um, thought that there was nothing in the universe except matter and physical forces. And so materialism was was all there was. And so if you were going to um, if, if you were going to achieve the biblical prophecy of everlasting life in a heavenly, perfect realm, you had to create that for yourself from science and technology. And the Russian cosmism movement that led to um, Tsiolkovsky and the rockets and Korolev and uh, Sputnik 1, all of that, at its foundation, was derived from thinking, if we're going to conquer our death with our medicine and people are going to live forever, where are they going to live? We're going to run out of space on the Earth, so uh, we're going to have to build rockets and explore space just to have places for people to live. Now, contrast that with, you know, um, uh, Blavatsky, uh, you know, who you mentioned and I talk about in the book. And she believed that materialism was occulting our view of what was actually reality, a kind of like a hidden spiritual realm. So she believed in this hidden spiritual realm. And that way we should actually ignore all things that we can see and measure and and search for enlightenment and how to reach this sort of, you know, perfection, you know, in a spiritual way. And that gives rise to modern um, astrology, horoscopes in newspapers and the idea that the, the sun's position in the zodiacal constellation at your birth is the dominant influence on your personality. And they linked it with the rise of psychoanalysis with Jung and Freud at the beginning of the 20th century and said that's what psychoanalysis is actually getting at, this deeper spiritual realm of astrology. So it's made me much more open minded and understanding about these these kinds of things. Um, so it's a new area of fascination for me. Um, but I suspect a book on witchcraft is a long way off yet. Oh, now, that is a pity. I'll have to do it myself then. The uh, oh, it is. It's, you, you talk about Russian uh, space program there, and that, that's in, in the book where you talk about the loss of ritual. And just talking the other day about with someone who I think it was Helen Sharma was explaining about, you know, she was over there with Gagarin Day. You know, there is a day where, and, and I wonder, you know, should we increasingly look towards creating rituals around things? Like, because that, that moment of where you might spend some time in a day thinking about someone like Yuri Gagarin or thinking about what Rusty Schweikart said or thinking about, you know, Helen Sherman's journey, the, the, those things to add some level of ritual to that will just give an opportunity of, of, of contemplation about some sense of reality as well. Absolutely. And the other thing that surrounds, uh, the, or that ritual gives us, and I sort of, uh, I sort of use ritual in 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 uh, what what kind of thing? lowercase letters as it were. So, so um, you know, it's but just coming together to think about similar things um, from our unique individual perspectives is cultural glue. It's things that allows us to empathise and discuss and get closer you know, to other um, people with other viewpoints. And it's, it's one of those things I think that could bring us closer together. So having these days, you know, World 
book day or, or or whatever it happens to be, or just days as you suggest, you know, where we could think about somebody who's tr in history who's truly achieved something and think about what that means to us, what that means for the world and what that means for the human race. Yeah, that's all to the good. Thank you very much, Stuart. Beneath the night is, well, it definitely is out because it's uh, it's out today, I think, the day we're recording this, the 1st of October, publication day. Um, and uh, and it will. It, it does that great thing, which I, I I think a lot of your writing does, which it, it changes the night sky. It means that when you, you, you look up at it, uh, it, I mean, I, and I think that's what all, you know, well, I suppose I was going to say great science writing, but all, all real great art as well it should be. It means that when you finished it, you think, oh, yeah, the world is not quite as it was the day before. Absolutely. That's um, that, that's what, as you say, all great art and science is, is, is there to do. Thank you very much, Stuart. And thank you very much to our producer. Thank you, Robin. It's been such a pleasure.